Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Praise the Lord! Welcome to this week's online service for Beverly Baptist Church. My name's Emily and I'm going to be leading our service today. Wherever you are and whenever you're watching this, it's really good for us to join together to praise God, even if it's just virtually. So let's begin our service this morning by singing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. any of our previous services in January, you'll know that we're currently in the middle of a series called Following God to New Places. We've been learning from the stories of people in the Bible whom God took on a journey to somewhere new. So far we've learned about Abraham and Moses and Joshua and today Phil is going to be sharing with us from the story of Ruth. Part of the reason behind this series is that God is taking us as a fellowship on a new adventure not just in terms of our planned move to the Armstrong's building, but also in terms of what that means for our future direction. But as Nigel reminded us last week, our whole lives and our journeys with God are constantly taking us to new places, whether that's new homes, new jobs, new schools, new adventures, or just new stages in our lives. It's great to learn and to be encouraged by hearing about what God has done in the past, in the lives of people hundreds of years ago. But it's also good to hear about what God is doing right now. So during our service this morning, we're going to be hearing from some current and past members of Beverly Baptist Church, all of whom have followed God to new places. I hope we'll be encouraged as we hear about God's faithfulness as they faced new challenges. So we're going to start by talking to Wendy and Andy, uh, who used to be far, part of our fellowship here in Beverly, but have moved away on a new adventure um, in the last 18 months. Hello, 
Hello. Hello. So what made you uproot from home and jobs and church uh, and move away from the area? Uh, very simply, it was a very clear invitation from God. Um, he presented it in the form of a job offer. Um, but we see that as a result of two and a half years of preparation. Um, we invested in study and prayer and reading inspirational and challenging books like Dirty Glory by Pete Gregg. Um, and all that meant that when the call came, there was absolutely no doubt it was from God. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we followed. <laughs> and so what has been daunting or challenging? Because it was quite a big move. <laughs> it was. Um, I think the thing that was hardest was leaving behind valued and trusted friends. Um, and the other side of that was... Um, locally, initially, we didn't have anybody to journey with because we had to start again and make new relationships. So that was really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing was when every aspect of your daily life is new, it's it's very tiring <laughs> and it takes a lot more energy and concentration. So that was challenging. Mm -hmm. And what difference did it make knowing that God was with you? I mean, it, knowing that affects everything and um, is just a huge difference. Um, so Thomas Merton said, um, your life is shaped by the end you live for. And knowing that God is with us and that he has this big plan to restore all things and make all things new, that means um, so much to how we try and live because we want to sort of seek first the kingdom of God in every situation. So because we know that God's with us, we also know we're still on a journey. Um, he hasn't finished. He didn't just drop us here. Uh, we know he has a lot more challenges for us, but we're okay with not knowing the details because he's here too. And as well as God being with you, how has God used you in this journey so far? Uh, so far, he's just got us doing lots of little things. Um, mostly about building relationships with the people around us. Um, so we've been litter picking. Uh, we've been trying to get to know people in the established part of the estate as well as the new part where we live. Um, we've done a little bit of supporting churches who have less than we do. Um, I've written a couple of sermons and even delivered one. Um, we have started serving at our church, the well, uh, just on the, on the door saying hello to people as they arrive. Uh, but that's been really good for getting to know people. Um, and one really encouraging things, um, over Christmas, we uh, started Advent windows on our new estate. So we got about 20 people involved who were prepared to display a window with the Christmas theme. And that really created a sense of community uh, where we are. And we remain on the lookout for whatever God's doing. Um, where might he be working? Where might he be calling us to work? Um, we still don't know what the big picture is. We still don't know what the big project is. Um, that we're here and we're waiting and we're ready and willing. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much uh, for sharing that with us. And and we do, of course, continue to to pray for you and enjoy hearing what you're up to over there. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. We'll move on to our notices now. As usual, for people who regularly attend Beverly Baptist Church, we've got a Zoom gathering at 11.30 after the service. It's an opportunity to catch up, uh, to chat and to pray together. The Zoom link should already have been sent out to you. Today, there's also an extra catch up for our children. Um, it's using the same link at 11.15. So I'd encourage any of you with, with families to log in early so that the children have a chance to see each other, do a few quick activities together before the rest of us join at 11.30. Also for the children, we're currently planning our holiday club in a box uh, for February half term. So if your children would like to have a box of activities delivered to them, please could you let Karen in the office know as soon as possible. We continue to celebrate special events in our church family. And while we can't meet together, we do have a team of crunchy fairies delivering chocolate treats to people we know of who have something to celebrate. It's been a quiet week for the fairies this week, um, but they did make sure that Julie, Phil and the family had a little housewarming gift to celebrate their house move this week. If you know of any other celebrations that are coming up, please let Karen know and she'll make sure the information is passed on to the Crunchy Fairies. 
Lastly, we're very aware that these are challenging times for everyone. So if you're ill or isolating, if you need any practical help, or if you just need someone to talk to because you're finding things tough, please do contact us via the church office. For the next in our modern day accounts of following God to new places, we're going to talk to Naomi because this is actually Naomi's last Sunday worshipping with us before she goes off on a new adventure. So Naomi, tell us uh, where are you going and what you're going to do? Uh, I'm moving up to Northumberland to work with the National Trust. I'm going to be a collections assistant at one of their properties, helping to look after all of the objects in the, in the property and also the, um, the house itself. Okay, and how do you feel about it? Is it daunting? Is it exciting? Um, obviously getting the job really exciting, especially uh, during these uh, pandemic times. Um, it's also a bit daunting because of the situation. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to go up there. Uh, I don't really know anybody there. And obviously I don't know when I'm going to be able to come home and visit my family. Mm. It's a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what difference does it make knowing that God is going with you? I mean, God has already been so much a part of this whole thing, getting the job in the first place. Um, it's through Church Connections that I've managed to find somewhere to live, so he's really been um, guiding my way. Um, and also just knowing that he's going to be with me, so even if I don't know anybody, it's a bit scary. I know that I know him, um, and also that there's going to be a church family there who I know that if I need anything, um, they would help me. <laughs> Um, for those of you that are watching this on Sunday morning, um, if you would like to say goodbye to Naomi and to pray for her before she goes, we're going to have an opportunity to do that as part of the Zoom um, at 11.30 after the service, so do join us for that if you'd like to. Let's come together and worship as we sing What a Beautiful Name. Glory. 
doesn't always mean moving across the country. For our children and young people, life is a whole series of new experiences, adventures and challenges. We're going to hear from Lydia now, who started at secondary school this year. Hi Lydia! Hi! Okay, so what were you nervous about before you started at secondary school? I was nervous about making friends and also because we didn't have our introduction day, I was nervous about getting lost and not finding my way around the school and missing lessons. <laughs> and what was it like when you actually started? What was good and what was challenging? Um, what was good was that you clicked with friends and it just kind of felt normal after the first day or even week. You, It just felt normal and you felt like you'd been there for ages but what was challenging was finding the boundaries of um like behavior in secondary school compared to um, primary school and also the amount of work it was it was a big step mm -hmm. yeah. and what difference did it make knowing that god was with you uh it made a big difference because I felt more confident and I felt that uh, he would be with me like through good bits and the bad bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Okay, thanks so, so much Lydia, bye. Thank you, bye. Sometimes the new places that life takes us to are unplanned, unexpected and challenging. 
not places that we've chosen to go. At the beginning of the Bible story of Ruth that we're going to be hearing about a bit later on, we find out that Ruth's husband died and her mother-in-law Naomi lost her two sons and her husband. We're going to hear from Judy next, whose husband Peter died two and a half years ago after a short and unexpected illness. Hello Judy. Hi. Hi there. So could you tell us then what have been the biggest challenges in moving to this new phase of your life? Well I think for me it's been um, this sudden change of, of um, this situation for me because it's so sudden and feeling alone, being on my own, um, having to make decisions on my own mm -hmm. and um, yeah and then just wondering what God's plans are for me now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what difference has it made knowing that God is with you on that journey? Well, day to day, um, just knowing, trusting that God does have his plans for me. Um, and he knows my needs as well, mm -hmm. better than I do. And he supplies them in many different ways. Um, in fact, each day I try, I wake up, I think, okay, God, you know my needs today better than I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any more of that. And then later in the day, I do acknowledge that. Um, and I have needed to keep my eyes on, on God and, and it's helped because I'm in a church community and where I am. And it, in the different ways, that people have, um, it's through people that have helped me to work through a lot of this, um, as well as reading God's word. And um, I just acknowledge that very much. Um, and whether it's been a letter or a call or a knock on the door, it's just been good to know that people care. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, of God's love that those people care mm -hmm. but it hasn't all been plain sailing because I've had some very low times yeah. and I literally had to grip my teeth and just know okay God you know all about this but I think I've also realized that I'm not a superwoman <laughs> and um, I need people as much as other people do and, and I've had to ask for help um in in lots of ways uh, but god's word does say that all things work together for good for those that love him and even though at times you think yes but i didn't really think it would be this way um i just know that it's true and that he he is there and i just have to keep looking up to remember he's there and um it's just lovely to have that assurance that God loves me and he cares. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you ever so much, Judy. Thanks for, for being so open and honest with us. Thanks and bye. Bye. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our lives are a series of new places, new adventures, new challenges. We thank you that we don't make that journey alone, but that you are with us, preparing the way for us, guiding us forward and remaining close to us every step of the way. We pray for those that we know who are currently experiencing big changes in life or are making plans for changes that lie ahead. We pray for our children and young people moving to new stages of their education in schools, colleges, and universities. We pray for those we know who are moving house, moving into new communities, for those in new jobs or changing work situations. We pray for those dealing with new situations in their personal circumstances, whether that's illness, bereavement or other challenges. We pray for our church community as we plan for our move to the Armstrong's building 
that you will continue to guide and lead us forward, showing us the plans you have for us and the part you want each one of us to play. In all of these situations, as we remember the story of Abraham, we remember that you promised to bless others through him and his descendants. So we ask not just that you will bless us, but that you will bless those around us through us. As we remember the story of Moses and how he sought the support of God's people before moving on, we thank you for putting us in a church family and we ask that you will show us how to love and support each other as we journey together. As we remember the story of Joshua, we ask for boldness as we follow you into new places, having confidence in you and you alone, trusting you for the future, knowing that whatever lies ahead, you hold us fast. Amen.
We are reading from Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Ophrah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food to them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you, will, you, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women explained, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she called them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Abraham, Moses, Joshua. Big names in the history of God's people, Israel. Leaders of families and of nations. Men with big stories attached to them. Men of faith who performed miracles, who communicated directly with God, who had big parts to play in God's plan for his people. Abraham, literally the father of the people. Moses, who led them out of slavery in Egypt and established them as a people group in their own right. Joshua, who took them over the Jordan and under whose leadership they conquered the promised land. The subject of today's story is different in many ways. If anyone who's been with us over the past few weeks has felt slightly intimidated by the people we've looked at, I'm not such a great person of faith, I don't have such an important role, what connection do I have with these people? Maybe you'll resonate a bit more with Ruth. Ruth, just an ordinary person. A woman with no special status in the eyes of the people around her. In fact, quite the opposite, a widow, which would have put her in many ways at the bottom of the social strata. But Ruth is nonetheless important. She's important for the things we can learn from her faith. And also because she ends up being the great, 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 many times over grandmother of Jesus. But the story of Ruth has another crucial difference from the others that we've looked at. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, 
all heard God speak, actively calling them to a role. Not so with Ruth. The book of Ruth, interestingly, shares a characteristic with another Old Testament book with a female lead character, the book of Esther, that God is silent and inactive. The initiative for Ruth's actions come from her, not from above, at least as the text portrays it. Perhaps that's another way in which some of us might identify more with Ruth than with our previous characters, in that absence of a feeling of a definite call or communication from God into our lives. But it is clear that Ruth is motivated by faith. And nowhere is that less clear than in the key verses which we're going to look at today. We're going to focus our attention on verses 16 to 18 of Ruth chapter 1. Where Ruth says to her mother-in-law that she will follow her wherever she goes. She will follow her because she's prepared to identify with her, to become one of Naomi's people, to follow Naomi's God. And I'm sure that's not a decision that she comes to on the spot there and then. She's been married to an Israelite, Israelite man for some 10 years. She's lived in a family steeped in worship of the Lord. She's been influenced by that in her own personal faith. She's seen something in the character and lives of these people that draws her to wish to identify with them and their faith. And so when the time comes, Ruth... Unlike Orpah, who turns back, Ruth cannot leave that behind. She must go with Naomi. She must go with God. The Holy Spirit has a sense of humour. So I'm preaching this week as we say goodbye to our own Naomi as she moves on to a new place. But you don't need to be called Naomi or Ruth to learn from this story and from Ruth's response. But I do want us to focus this morning on the message that this story, this passage has for each of us as individuals, rather than as the church collectively. And Ruth's response to Naomi has three elements. A promise to follow, a commitment to Naomi's people, and a faith in Naomi's God. In that culture, they would have been inextricably linked to live with someone, to properly live with them on an equal basis as part of their culture, rather than, than as a slave or a foreigner who would be to some extent excluded from some aspects of life. To properly live with someone required embracing their people and becoming one of them. And ethnicity and religion was so intertwined that to become part of a people was to accept their deity or deities. So Ruth cannot follow without also embracing the people and the God, but she's very willing to do so. We're in a different time where our culture would see these things as being more separate. We can pick and choose, mix and match. But actually, I think the message from Ruth for us this morning is there's a sense in which this is an illusion. They're just as interlinked for us as they were for Ruth. God his people and his mission. We cannot choose which of those we wish to have and which we wish, want to leave to one side. We don't have the option of missing out one or indeed more. God, his people and his mission. Let's look at each of these in turn. We'll actually take the order backwards. Let's start with God's mission. We come to faith in Christ. We make a personal commitment to him. We join a church. We settle in, make friends get stuck into a ministry of one kind or another, into activity. We enjoy it. We feel safe and comfortable. We find church strengthens our faith. Worship restores us. We feel close to God. The community around us supports us, prays for us. We openly claim to be Christian. We try to read our Bibles, even if not as much as we'd ideally like. Uh, we maintain a life of prayer. All seems to be going well. We feel at peace with ourselves. Those around us see us as a strong Christian, mature and wise and dependable. But is there space in this for the mission of God? For the following him, 
not just in everyday life, not just in maintaining the church community, but the following him to new places, to wherever he wishes to lead us, the being active in mission. Ruth and Orpah had been in this position already, in a sense. They'd become part of Naomi's family when they'd married her sons, and they'd remained part of that family even when widowed. They'd identified themselves with that people, and in, in doing so with their God, whose worship would have been central to their family life and the way they did things. And they'd been doing that quite comfortably for a while. We, we don't actually know exactly how long, but, but they'd been doing so living in the land of Moab and quite happy with that seemingly. No indication that they'd sought to find other husbands, to move out from Naomi's household, to go back to Moabite culture. And they both express an initial willingness, even a desire, to come with Naomi, to go back to your people, it is at this point. But faced with Naomi's initial response, no, go back to your own people and your own gods, Orpah is actually not willing to break those links. She decides ultimately, ultimately she's, she's not able to fully identify with the Lord and his people. Ruth is. But in doing so, she has to accept that that means obedience to the call to follow to a new place. Outside of what she has known, outside of her comfort zone, because ultimately that is where God is taking her. May the Lord deal with me if even death separates you and me, she says to Naomi. She recognises the Lord is calling her to stay with Naomi. And so it must be for us. If we are serious about making God our God and making his people, the church, our people, then we must be serious with that, about heeding the call of God to follow with his people wherever he leads them and us. You don't get the option, I'm afraid, none of us do, of being a follower of Jesus and part of his church but opting out of his mission. We don't get to be in church just to take the benefits for us, but to abdicate our responsibility to be reaching out to others with the good news of Jesus, to be drawing new people into the community of faith, to be a people who are never quite static and comfortable, but always on the move as God calls us to go. To identify with God's people is to go where they go and to actively play your part in what that community is doing on mission. Some of you might be thinking, but I don't know what my part is. I'm not sure how I can contribute to the mission of the church, to God's mission. Well, rest assured, you do have a part to play. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says this. Talking about the church. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. If the foot should say... Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And every one of us has a part to play in the church. And most of us are probably already fulfilling it without even realising it. RE homeschooling these past couple of weeks for our boys has been thinking about all the different people who make up the community of the church and have a role to play within worship. Our list will be slightly different from the Catholic tradition of our boys' school, but we might look at musicians, welcomers, those who provide tea and coffee, readers, Sunday school leaders, preachers, setup teams, service leaders, those who pray in our service or for individuals after the service. In our current times, we might add video editors. And that's just worship. 
when we get into the rest of the life of the church, administrators, website designers, prayer warriors, house group leaders, people with a ministry of encouragement, those who keep in touch with the elderly, the sick or those on the margins, those who will drop everything to help people with practical issues, to move furniture or to fix things, we could go on and on. Each important necessary roles within the life of the church and the mission of the church. Last week, the church on earth lost a saint. I was going to say someone who none of you will have heard of, but there's no knowing who's watching these online services. But certainly none of you in Beverly Baptist, I'm sure, will have heard of this gentleman. Ron was a member of the church I grew up in in rural Lancashire. A quiet and unassuming man. A former miner who, despite the effects of that on his lungs, made it past 90. He used to say, apparently, no one will miss me. But that's very much not true. Quite apart from his faith, in which he quietly pointed people to Jesus, he had a whole range of ministries. You arrived at church and the door was unlocked because Ron had unlocked it. The church was warm because Ron had been over at 6.30am to put the heating on. The first person you probably met was Ron, who would welcome you with a handshake and offer you a hymn book and a Bible. The grass outside the church was neat and tidy because Ron had mowed it. The church choir had a bass voice because Ron was singing in it. And it wasn't just inside the church either. When one of my dad's string of unreliable bangers had once again failed to start even after we'd bumped it all the way down the hill, who was there with the WD-40 and the jump leads? You've guessed it. Age meant he possibly hadn't done most of those tasks for some years now, but Ron will still be very much missed. We will each have our own ministries. But being part of God's church without being involved in its mission is not an option. And if you're struggling to know where you fit in and how you can be involved, please do speak to one of the leadership team. We'll probably tell you that you're already doing lots of things that you haven't really noticed. But we can also help you to understand more what it looks like for you when you say, where you go, Lord, I will go. So that's God's mission, God's people. A bit briefer on this one, because if you're watching this service, you're probably not admitting this element of our faith. But there are those who, for various reasons, try to live the Christian life alone. People with a genuine faith in Jesus, with a real desire to follow where God is leading, to be involved in his mission, but who don't see church community as being a necessary part of that. Ruth couldn't have set off to go with God without having Naomi as her companion on the road. And in fact, as the story unfolds, we find Ruth marrying a relative of Naomi's and, and her relationship with Naomi is crucial in allowing that to happen. And so for us too, we need other people's companionship and gifts on the way, as we saw a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Moses. There are various reasons why people sometimes disconnect from church. I do want to acknowledge because it's important. Those for whom church has been a painful experience in the past and who therefore find it very difficult to be part of a church fellowship, find it hard to trust people, hard to commit, hard to take the risk of being hurt again. That could be those who've suffered abuse at the hands of church people in one of the many forms which abuse takes could be physical or sexual abuse, bullying, manipulation. It could be that people have been made unwelcome, even driven out of churches because of their sexual orientation or their relationship status. It could be those who found churches unable or unwilling to provide what is needed for their disability. I'm not wanting to minimise any of that. And the church needs to repent and say sorry for much hurt which has been caused over the years. And I understand why for people in those situations it can be so hard to be part of institutional church. But even then, <clears throat> having some Christian friends and contacts is still so important. 
And for those of us who don't have such reasons to stay away from the more institutional forms of church, it's vital that we connect in and with the people of God. Because church exists for a reason. We are, as we've already seen from Corinthians, despite our flaws, the body of Christ. Church community is the place that we find Jesus on earth. Church can support and encourage and pray for and challenge and equip and teach and a whole manner of other things. Yes, there are still some missionaries called to places where there's no existing church community. And there are Christians hidden in parts of the world where Christian community is prohibited who are on their own. And God is very gracious in supplying what such people need. But that's not to be the norm. That's not what we seek. It's important for us to be with God's people if we are to grow our relationship with God and keep connected with his mission. Because if we lose the people of God, we will almost certainly lose the mission and God himself. I've seen too many people over the years drift away from faith. And in almost every case, it has begun with them disconnecting from Christian community and friendships. And then without those supports around them, God gradually becomes less and less important to them until eventually he disappears altogether. The tragedy of this year is that some who've been disconnected from church community by lockdown won't go back. As lockdown lifts, we need to be looking out for our Christian friends, ensuring our brothers and sisters come back into community with us. And if anyone watching this is tempted to think, I'm OK, I can do church online and not reconnect with physical people. Please think again. There are also some who manage to disconnect from church and keep their faith. But what tends to happen then is they lose sight of God's mission. Without the constant challenge of other believers and the constant checks and balances of discussion and prayer together, they can end up in a very narrow and twisted view of what God is calling them to do. In fact, sometimes that's what starts the process. People disconnect from church because they can't find a church that agrees with them on something. And rather than taking that as a prompt to consider whether maybe they're not right, they end up dismissing other Christians as being wrong and retreating into an ever-diminishing bubble. If we're serious about following God in his mission, we have to be serious about doing that with God's people even when we disagree with them or find them difficult. Because they are also the place of encouragement and growth. Thirdly, God. God's mission, God's people, but we also need to keep hold of God. It may seem self-evident, but there's a real possibility that God can disappear out of the equation. Ruth's declaration that your God will be my God is vital. Because this is not just Ruth deciding to stay with a familiar friend. It's not just a calculated decision that by remaining with Naomi she'll have a support network. It's not just a desire to remain part of the family she's been with. There's a recognition that she does this in response to God and with God. She could have done much of what she goes on to do without that realisation. She could have gone with Naomi as part of her family without God really coming into the picture at all. It would have had impact further down the line, but at this stage, she could have done that. And that can be possible for us too. We can be part of a church community, excited about what's being done, finding jobs, ways we can be involved. Enthusiastic, dedicated, committed. But what are we committed to? It can become just a commitment to the people who've become our friends and our family. We want to be with them. We want to work together with them. We get a sense of achievement with working for a team. And we're doing some worthwhile things. We can totally see the need for the food bank or the social drop-in or whatever it might be. But where is God in this? Have we stopped thinking about whether this is what God still wants us to do? Have we stopped praying for him to work through this mission? Have we lost sight of the need not just to do good things, but to do them for and with God, and in a way that makes him visible to those we are helping? 
can be a danger for whole churches who can end up becoming just another social service, or even worse, just a social members club. But it can be a risk for individuals too. We need to check why we're still doing what we're doing. Why we are going where we're going. Is God still in it? If you turn up enthusiastically during the week for your mission activity, but are rarely seen on Sunday morning, or if you are, it's kind of because you feel you have to. Is that because the mission has become the important thing at the expense of the God whose mission it is? If you're still doing the same things as you were doing 15 years ago, is that because it's still the right thing to do? It might be. Or is it just habit? When was the last time you asked the question about whether this is still God's mission for you? And how are you doing it? What difference does God make to not just where you're going, but how you are going? Is there anything distinctive about the way you do things in the life and mission of the church from somebody who didn't have any faith at all? I've asked some challenging questions this morning. I hope there's also been some encouragement for us. As we go into this week, into this year, into the rest of our lives, will we, like Ruth, take these th three things with us? Can you say, I will go where God leads me, willing to play my part in the mission which he's called me to, to make Jesus known in word and in deed to my friends, my neighbours and the world? And if you're unclear how you fit into that picture, where and how God is calling you to go, talk to a trusted Christian friend. Ask them what they see as your gifts, what they believe you have to offer. You might be surprised by the answer. Can you say God's people will be my people? Committing to be part of the community of faith, the Church of Jesus Christ, in whatever form that takes. Dedicating yourself to love and work with these people in good times and in challenging times. As together we are his body here on earth. If you're not embedded in a church community at the moment, please do try to find one. Or at least some of the Christians you can talk and pray with. And if you're in Beverly, we'd love for Beverly Baptist to be part of your journey going forward. And can you say, God is my God. Jesus is my Lord and Saviour. In all that I do, I am motivated by a desire to live and work for him, to do things in his power and in the way he would like them to be done, making him central to who I am. If you know that's not true in your life, then please do reach out to us and we can help you to begin that journey of faith in him. None of us will ever live up to this perfectly. We know God's grace as we continue to work this out in our lives. But for each of us individually and indeed for us as a church community too, it's a useful check to keep coming back to. God, his people and his mission. Are we holding all three of these elements in balance in our lives. I'm going to leave a moment of silence now for us to reflect on that question. And then I'll read a paraphrase of these verses we've been looking at for us each to make our prayers. First, a moment of silent reflection. Lord, where you go, 
I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And you will be my God. I know that nothing, not even death, can separate me from your love. I offer myself once again to live in your service. Amen. who's helped in our service this morning. Thank you to Phil for his sermon, to Alison, Naomi and Mary for helping lead our sung worship, to Ellie for the reading and to Andy, Wendy, Naomi, Lydia and Judy for sharing something with us about their journeys with God. Thank you too for Josh doing all of the technical stuff behind the scenes and thank you for joining with us in worship today. If you have any questions or you want to discuss anything from this morning's service, uh, then please do get in touch with us. Don't forget the children's catch up Zoom meeting at 11.15 and then our usual wider church catch up at half past 11. For now, we're going to close our time of worship with a prayer of committal written by Joe Wells, the Bishop of Dorking. Let's pray. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, 
by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>